is share my screen. Rhonda, I'm handing over to you for the introduction. I want to take the time to thank each and every one of our ASQ Innovation Technical Community members, community, our moderator, and especially our panelists for this evening. You are the reason we serve in our webinars and why we designed the special event just for you. Next slide, please. As you'll see and hear during tonight's presentation, innovation is all about uncovering what other people have not seen before or thought before. It's by looking at the everyday and taking that and applying it in different ways where we build the bridge to transformative innovation. And you'll hear through our facilitated discussion tonight, the scale and scope of which innovation can be embedded within and across your organizations, your teams, and within the community and world at large. Next slide, please. I'm now so glad to introduce you to Miss Rebecca Mott, who is a core leader within the Tennessee Valley Authority in the technical training and innovation areas. She is a champion for continuous improvement across Lean Six Sigma and innovation with over 25 years of utility experience. She enjoys using her analytical skills, business acumen, and strategic thinking to lead teams through change and transition. She lives by the motto, none of us is as smart as all of us together. She's an inclusive leader looking for opportunities to bring people and teams together to solve problems. Let's welcome Ms. Rebecca Mott and welcome our panelists this evening. Well, thank you, Rhonda, for that warm introduction. And we have an exciting panel here for you to talk about the important topic of innovation. We know that innovation is at the top of the list of a lot of companies today due to the rapid changes taking place in the world, in markets, in industries. And today we want to hear from some leading industry experts as well as some innovation experts on what things you can be focused on to move innovation forward in your organization. And so I'm going to kick this round table discussion off with a mix of introduction and a little feedback from our panelists. So we'll go one by one and I, I will introduce each panelist. And after I introduce the panelists, I would like the panelists to answer this question before I go to the next panelist. And the question is, what does innovation mean to you? What does innovation mean to you? So first up, I would like to introduce Sean Chandler. Sean is a technology and standards expert in the in energy industry, and he's a member of the editorial board of the Internet of Things magazine. He's a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, uh, better known as IEEE, and the chair of the Global Blockchain for Energy Interoperability Task Force, uniting the Internet of Things distributed ledger technology. His past work includes contributions to the United Nations 2050 Roadmap for Sustainability, the U.S. Congressional Smart Cities Caucus, and the International Energy Agency's Roundtable on Digitally Enabled Business Models. 
Welcome, Sean Chandler. And Sean, what does innovation mean to you? Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, innovation to me means uh, actionable intelligence, uh, which has been converted into a, a capability uh, in an organization or a company or an ent any entity. And how that innovation uh, takes form is really about uh, how we have collaborated together and, and driven from the way that things are to the way things need to be in order to answer specific problems in the most efficient way. I'll, I'll add that. Thank you, Sean. Next up is Luciana Pauli. Luciana is a culture coach, speaker, and book author and CEO of Biz Storming Training and Consulting, LLC. She is an MBA, quality engineer, agile coach, and scrum master. As a coach, she has helped individuals, small businesses, <coughs> and Fortune 100 companies drive change, empowerment, and innovation. Most employees and entrepreneurs find a time in their lives where they feel stuck, discouraged, and motivated. Luciana helps them find their strength, empowering them to change their core habit and become their best self. Her recently published book, 5S Your Life, to improve team productivity and self-organization, uh, uh, has been published, and it's, she's a regular contributor for Forbes, Thrive Gold Global, and other international media outlets. She's Argentinian, lives in Texas, and is bilingual English Spanish. Welcome to the panel discussion, Luciana, and we would like to hear from you. What does innovation mean to you? And Luciana, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, so to me, innovation is um, applying an idea or a combination of ideas uh, in a profitable way. It's not only um, you not, not only have an idea, but you need to uh, use it. You need to be able to sell it, and someone needs to be able to take advantage of that. So uh, that's innovation, and in order to achieve that, you need to set free uh, the employees within a company. So I think this is, I don't want to go deeper because this is going to be part of the discussion probably that we're going to have today, but innovation has to do with uh, individuals that are, uh, are free to think and to offer uh, their point of view. So it's uh, going to be more coming Freud. <laughs> Thank you, Luciana. And then, last but certainly not least, we have Karen Tilstra. Karen lives, wants to live in a world that's free, work is fast, and chocolate is devoid of calories. I like that. She believes everyone is created with leadership potential, and the world would be a whole lot happier if we'd all embrace this truth. Uh, she's committed to helping busy uh, people develop their inner wellspring of creativity. She's founder and president of Creativity Effect and has spent the last 10 years helping to create innovation labs and develop design thinking teams for healthcare systems, government agencies, universities, and Fortune 500 companies. She co-designed the nation's first undergraduate degree in innovation and social social entrepreneurship at Rollins College. And she has developed an organizational innovation model, the Orchard uh, Model of in Innovation. Karen has served as university faculty for universities in the USA and Asia. She's currently visiting professor at Rollins College and Advent Health University. She was the Executive Fellow for Innovation at Santa Clara University and served on Innovation Advisory Boards in the USA and Europe. Welcome to the platform, Karen Tilstra. And Karen, what does innovation mean to you? Well, it's hard to, to actually pin it down, but I think for me, it means the perfect melding 
of curiosity, compassion, and courage, and what results from that is innovation. Wow. I like that. So today we want to talk about innovation from various perspectives. And so I will be asking our panelists to pitch in on these questions that I'll be asking. And if you have any questions that you want to ask our panelists, please drop those in the chat portion of the, uh, the WebEx event, and we will pick up as many questions as we can for our panelists. First, I would like to ask Karen, what is your favorite innovation and why? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, I think my favorite innovation is innovation that has been, that is the result of people solving a big challenge that makes it better for a lot of people. So it's um, not necessarily a one thing that makes one person maybe wealthier, but it's a it's something that people develop together to answer a nagging problem that they were facing that really improved the lives of a lot of people. That that would be my favorite innovation. Or were you asking for like to specifically like a better glass or something like that? No, that sounds really good. Okay. Um, and so and so when you when you think about um, bringing people together, so. Luciana, you have spent time helping teams and bringing teams together, coaching teams as an agile coach, coach and scrum master. Uh, when you think of what it takes to bring a team together to create innovation, uh, what are some of the things that have to be present on that team in order for them to be open to innovating and being creative? Yes, um, well, one of the most important things is to um, allow the employees to think freely, as I said before. Um, some companies uh, just say, well, this is the time to let me and come up with an idea. But many employees are afraid to speak up. So the first thing that you need to do as a company is reduce the risk for innovating. So. Um, Tell the employee that you can make mistakes. If you make mistakes, don't punish them. Uh, and don't say it, but just do it. Do it that way. That's what, over time, you're going to uh, you're gonna help your employees come out with, with new ideas. Um, so that's one thing, how you reduce the risk of innovate, innovating or providing new ideas. Um, then you have to uh, facilitate the resources to that, um, allow the time to do that, um, maybe meet them or uh, offer opportunities for meeting with other, um, with other employees. Um, for example, a, a nice example of this is uh, Google. I don't know if any of you have been uh, to the Google Quartz Complex, Right now, probably is close to everyone, but I was able to go there in uh, 2019, in November, right before COVID started. And uh, one of the things they had to help people innovate was a, a bicycle that uh, there were four people could get into that bicycle. So you could have a meeting uh, outside and, uh, and have the meeting while you were uh, on that bicycle. So if that doesn't bring innovation, what does it, right? <laughs> so uh, it's it's a good way that companies can say, okay, we want you to think in a different way. We want to we want you to be open to other things. So why don't you try this? Uh, companies need to create environment for employees to be able to um, provide ideas uh, and innovate. So. When you're when you're thinking about uh, innovating, and I, I like the way you frame that, Luciana, around um, just opening up to, to to people to the art of possible, and also making it safe for them to fail. Uh, taking it from
from a technology perspective, I'd like Sean to pitch in and talk about uh, when you're dealing with technology such as blockchain and uh, we're looking at how that uh, technology is adopted over time. Where, where does that failure, you know, the failure and, and embracing failure, making it safe uh, to experiment and how does that all play into of the adoption of technology such as blockchain? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, the adoption of blockchain, because it's such an innovative technology, I mean, it's been around for you know many, many years now. Uh, but part of the issue, I, I think, as Luciana mentioned, is that is that there's high risk. And by removing the risk and saying, well, what, what can we do? What can we achieve? It, it really needs to focus on, well, specific achievements failing to make innovation explicit and you know useful uh, when you asked you know what do I think about innovation I, I, I said well it's actionable information and it has to be actionable because you have to be able to draw people together and that can that can deal with resources as Luciana had mentioned uh, it could it could be because you know, uh, the structure inside the corporation or inside the entity uh, isn't sufficient to take on the new innovation because of power relationships uh, in, in executive ranks, even sometimes uh, that, can, that can occur, of course. So trying to draw together all the appropriate resources, I think, is one of the most important things there in the technology framework, especially because when you deal with standards, and I work in the standards industry, uh, standards are there to help innovators work together across an industry rather than just on their own by establishing a standard of a way to do things, let's say a framework, but it needs to be abstract enough to allow the technology to connect in many different places. And that I think is always the challenge. So when an innovator comes up with something that doesn't connect to anything very well, then you can find that that can be a, a greater challenge in the technology domain. Wow, those are some really good points. And 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 you talked about the, the risk, right, and the, the willingness of, of different industries to take that risk. And Karen, I would like you to, to, to come back to you and ask you about that risk part because you've dealt with uh, healthcare systems, government agencies, which can tend to be risk adverse. And when when you see that that uh, risk averse the uh, approach that some of these industries take. How do you navigate them through that? And what are some of the things that uh, you need to focus on to help move people away from that risk averse approach? Well, one thing that I have found has been helpful for me is to invite people to um, really challenge what I call the three myths of the Western world which are, um, in my, from my point of view, um, that we have kind of built a lot of our corporate culture and behavior on the idea that we have to know everything before we start, rational thinking is best, and nothing is connected. And when you actually invite leaders from all levels of the organization to challenge that, to say, we don't have to know everything before we start, Rational thinking is good, but in a highly disruptive environment, you need the balance of rational and creative thinking and that everything is connected. And I found that when we ask the leaders to really think about that and how that applies to their life, all of a sudden they start relaxing and realizing, okay, I guess we don't have to know everything before we start. And then if you couple that with uh, rapid cycle, uh, iterative learning and rapid cycle um, prototyping and feedback loops, it starts making sense. But I found you have to give them actual experience in that, that um, you don't have to know everything before you start. And it sounds so crazy because it's so, it it's actually makes sense. We all know we can't know everything before we start. We can't know everything. But we tend to get so focused that we have to have everything pinned down. Just today we're working with uh, some county, the mayor and the county here in um, Central Florida. And th that was one thing we were challenging is we were doing a hackathon next Thursday with a whole group of the county. And 
uh, one of the leaders said, but we've got to have everything known. I said, well, we actually can't have everything known. We can know as much as we can and then just stay open and flexible. I think when leaders start to realize the truth in that, they start to relax and they start to not take themselves so seriously. They can take the work seriously, but not themselves so seriously. And we're all human and we all actually have it within us to be creative. And it's like, I found when you lower the risks for them by saying, let's fail fast and cheap so we can learn faster, it starts to make sense. But a lot of, my experience anyway, I've encountered a lot of high level leaders and middle managers who have never actually heard that, that failure we learn from, and that if we set it up right and fail fast, it's, it's safe. But there's a lot of unnecessary stress and seriousness in the corporate world that doesn't have to be there. There's enough that does have to be there that we don't have to make more than necessary. And um, anyway, I, I think it's fun to help leaders just <laughs> realize to, you can embrace the risk and that it's not been the world most of the time and very rarely are our things we're doing lives depend on it. I mean, we've worked a lot in healthcare and in surgery rooms and doing um, innovation projects. And even there, you know, there's room. But people have to get used to it. They have to be led to, through the idea that we're innovative and that means trial and error. So that's kind of <laughs> That's kind of how I look at it. So do you, when you look at the, the creativity piece, Karen, um, I, I would see that it's, when I, when I hear creativity, I think of, you know, uh, professions like writing or, you know, being a musician. Uh, how, how, how do those, how do those relate? So when you get into the technical, versus what we typically think of as the more creative, like the art. Right. Um, what are some of the common threads there between uh, the mind, the, you know, the mindset you have to have to be creative, <laughs> whether you're in a technical environment or, or you're in a more artistic environment? I love that uh, question because when we started getting into healthcare in 2010, I didn't think healthcare, it sounds crazy now, but I didn't think healthcare was that, creative until I saw some of the things nurses come up with and the things that doctors are innovating as they go and the um, and teachers, it's it's really inspiring to see what people come up with when they, they have to. And I think every profession has constraints and creativity thrives in constraints and it doesn't matter. Of course, my husband's an artist, so I see him creating things all the time, but I, I get excited when I see somebody in a tight constraint and they have a bold ambition and they start to create some pretty amazing things and oftentimes it's cheaper, simpler, and faster. It's just how we look at it. I think our biggest problem is we define innovation too narrowly, too narrowly. Or creativity we define too narrowly also because creativity is everywhere. Everywhere there's life, and life is everywhere. You dig down the, in the earth of a foot, and you're going to find life. Two feet. Everywhere. I mean, living in Florida, oh, my goodness. <laughs> there's too much life sometimes. There's all kinds of things around. Anyway, I, <laughs> I think I answered a little too long. No, that's, that's <laughs> perfect. And and. So, Luciano, when you, when you think about, uh, you know, working with teams in, in terms of creativity, what do you think are the most important aspects of encouraging more innovation um, within our teams specifically? Um, well, um, I think, um, as I said before, basically what, what you need to do is, is to cre create an environment, right, that, uh, that they feel comfortable. Um, one of the aspects um, that can encourage people is, for example, um, work on psychological safety, how they can feel um, safe to, to say what they, what they think. So kind of what um, what I, Karen was saying on when when you need to write or when you need to do something creative, 
um, I think that um, uh, one of the things that uh, that helps team is okay. Come up with all the ideas that you have. Uh, don't prevent any idea for uh, from being written down. Just just keep a, a place or parking lot anything that you can store all the ideas. Uh, be free to do that. Um, and on top of that, um, you can also provide some framework, something like this uh, mentioned, Sean, uh, and I think like tools, uh, training people with some tools, kind of uh, design thinking, for example, is something that can help people be more innovative because um, on, on one hand, we're saying that innovation is going raw and maybe going crazy with uh, crazy ideas, but it's also about uh, finding a way to innovate. Um, you can you can use these methods. For example, design thinking, uh, it, uh, it promotes people to start uh, looking at uh, the process that you want to improve or looking at someone buying something and thinking how they can do it better. Uh, maybe you can decompose the problem or, or the product in different pieces so that you can find different ways of, of doing that. Um, so it's not just telling people um, go and innovate, but provide the resources and training um, this type of methods, this type of tools. Um, I think it's it's key. Yeah, so I, I, I can see where it's like making sure you've got a, a good set of tools in your toolbox and you've equipped the team mm -hmm. to be able to, with the processes and the frameworks to be able to create and innovate. Right. That is fantastic. Um, I want to circle back to a thought that uh, Sean floated out earlier in his response about making sure that uh, when we are creating, inventing, innovating, that it solves a real problem. So, uh, Sean, do you feel like current innovations are helping to remedy our world problems or, or do they cause some as well? Like, you know, are there unintended consequences? Have you seen that happen from some of uh, the innovations that you've seen in your field? Boy, that's a very good question, Rebecca. I I would say uh, there are always unintended consequences in any complex system. Uh, I'm a system scientist, and systems, especially complex systems, where there are many parts and many interacting pieces, uh, when we think about an initiative and we say, well, you know, we want to get this accomplished and we're going to do this, and it's some, a new innovation or a new, you know, some creative method, let's say it's a process innovation, uh, then that process, you know, causes some trouble for someone else. And so the unintended consequence there is one that could be considered financial uh, because your process, although it helped you, it, it harmed someone else. And so I like to think about it in terms of equilibrium. Uh, when you're trying to solve a specific problem, you need to look at equilibrium between all the pieces in the problem. And in order to do that, and this gets back over to the tool side, it's important to map out the innovation in terms of its interaction in this complex system in which this system is innovating. When you think about systems in an abstract way and across many systems or many parts of systems, if you don't map them and understand the interaction and the interoperability between all those pieces, then you could have more unintended consequences rather than less. So it's really about the collaboration and making sure that the right people are in the room, uh, trying to get more people involved rather than fewer, uh, talk to your partners, talk to your you know, the innovation can't just be in a box, and I'll stop there. Wow, that's a very interesting perspective. So coming from a, from systems thinking, you know, because uh, uh, typically when I think of systems, I think of structure, and that can that can seem like it's confined, but you're saying uh, it, joining that systems thinking with a mindset of thinking how can we uh, uh, get more people involved and open it to more minds and more perspectives and more thoughts. Yes, absolutely. Because the, the additional perspectives from additional, let's call them system actors, and those can be computers today, artificial intelligence, machine learning, yeah, that can be a system actor today. And you can have unintended consequences of system actors acting in a system. Uh, even if it's innovative, it may it may do some harm, and there's there's so many examples. Uh, we can all think of some in 
recent history, I'm sure. Uh, but the idea to, to find the correct collaborators to identify the parts of the system and then come up with that world view and how this innovation will map out across that system, th that tends to be a best practice approach in my opinion. Excellent. And so, so when you're looking at this, so I've heard design thinking, I've heard systems thinking or as some frameworks and tools that, that we need to uh, understand in order to make, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the support of the innovation real and then also marrying that to or underpinning that with creativity, right, and, and that creativity framework. Uh, Karen, I, 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 do you have any other, like, specific frameworks or tools, models that you, um, that you look at when you're, you know, supporting businesses and embracing innovation? Um, <laughs> yes, we, uh, well, one thing, I love design thinking because it's very uh, easy for people to grasp. It's rather self-correcting. And it's, uh, so I, we've developed a lot of uh, tools to kind of make design thinking even easier than it is. And one thing that I found recently is helpful is when we're working with organizations, for example, um, we've worked with a couple, they're like 20,000, 30,000 people, and the the top guy is saying, I would like to have a culture of innovation start to roll throughout this organization. It's really overwhelming for people. It's like, it's overwhelming for me. It's like, how are we going to do this? So in the last couple of years, I've been teaching design thinking and a, a few other innovation models through the idea of launching, leading, landing, and learning. So how do you launch an innovation initiative or get a team ready to innovate, then how do you lead the innovation itself, and then how do you land it, and then um, how do you learn from it? And I, um, several years ago, I don't think I would have ever thought myself being that uh, systematic, but I really, I liked, I liked what Sean said, you know, the system's thinking, um, everyone can benefit from more of that. So I have found by taking people through a segments of an innovation process or developing an innovation lab within an organization or um, getting them ready to actually become facilitators of innovation in their organization, dividing it up, tools that help us launch innovation. And there's lots of them. And at any tool we have, I always tell people, adapt it, make it work for you. Um, I, I maybe got this from somebody and I changed it or we think, it, also anything we think we develop, we just wait a few weeks and we've learned, oh, they have it over there too. So I found there's really nothing new under the sun. But the big thing is, it's help for me anyway, helping people be in the segment of uh, first helping them see the big picture where we're going, and then like, okay, now we're gonna launch. Let's launch. Let's learn what that means. What tools, mindsets, and skills are in that? How do we lead now the innovation process? Tools, mindsets, and skills. How do we land it? Tools, mindsets, and skills. And in, inside of the landing is story and how we implement and what level of implementation. And then learning is to me. There's nothing that we gain if we can't reflect, because learning is not, without reflection, there's really no learning. And so this, to me, the last part is always going back, what did we learn? What can we do better next time? But there's so many tools. Um, if a person wants to have a lot of tools, or um, the design thinking model itself has, is very intuitive, and you can lead it with kind of few tools if you want, but I have found it's good to have lots of tools that people can draw from. I don't know if that was a confusing answer, but I, I, I have found putting people on a pathway or creating a platform that they can stand on or a path they can follow is always better. And I didn't used to think that. Ten years ago, I thought, you know, we need to let people kind of find our way, just give them a direction, kind of. And But now I say, this, we're in the launching stage, so here's some tools for launching. Um, here's maybe a, a project brief. Here's how to find the, what I call the power source, the big guy that's going to give thumbs up for even to run a project. 
How do you find team members? How do you um, do it, run an empathy safari? That when you give them tools, they can generalize it in the project, but then my goal is that they always can take it and apply it in their, either professionally or personally. And when they have the tools, and they can, then they can actually start to create more broadly on their own. So we become pretty tool-driven in a lot of the stuff we do, but it falls always in those, I have every, all of those four categories, launching, leading, landing, and learning. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been fun, and, and people, I just love to see what they do with the things. Once they try it and learn it, it's like, oh, we can tweak it this way, or we can try it that way, or our group over here was, um, like, we were working with a group of firemen. They were very different than a group of doctors. So, yeah, tools, lots of tools. And easy to find tools, too, if people just want to look online for tools. I'm sure that Sean and um, – oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> have a lot of tools, I'm sure, um, too. So, tools are good. Yeah, and, 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 to, and to that tool point, so – uh, Luciana, in your bio, uh, I read that you had uh, a book called Five S Your Life, and oh. as a continuous improvement champion, Five S is one of my favorite tools in my continuous improvement bucket. But when you're looking at uh, continuous improvement and you know tools like Five S, right, which is which is a very structured. Um, how do you, what do you say is the primary difference between um, tools that you would put in a continuous improvement bucket and tools that you would put in, in the innovation bucket? Well, when you're uh, doing continuous improvement, usually you're doing uh, small continuous improvements. Like in 5S, that's where you're trying to drive. You're trying to, whatever you're doing your day-to-day, -day, just how you make it a little better. So I think um, that the main difference would be what is the investment and in resources that you dedicate to innovating or to uh, do continuous improvement. So when you're doing 5S, you can also do innovation, but um, you're trying to focus on, you know, doing something small at least. Um, when in, your, uh, in the machine you're, you're using, how are you cleaning it? Can you clean it in a different way? So you tweak little things. Um, but when you're trying to innovate, you are, you are trying to disrupt something. Maybe, um, you know, clean it in a different way. Or maybe, um, I don't know, transforming a process uh, uh, totally. You, you start from, from uh, the end instead of starting from the beginning. So um, I think that that's, that's the main difference. You're going to try to... Uh, to be more open to more ideas than what you would do in continuous improvement. I think um, you need both, really. Um, it's, it's good that, in, that you, as a leader, uh, help your employees think about, okay, what is it that we need right now? Do we really need to, um, for example, and we need to save a lot of money here in this project. If we need to do like a big leap, yeah, you may try to do kind of an innovation, try to use, tool, use tools um, such as design thinking or try to use empathy to, to think in a different way. Uh, as I said before, try to decompose um, the different parts to come up with something totally different. Or maybe, um, but when you're trying to do continuous improvement, you don't, ha you, you don't go that far uh, at first. So um, it's... Really, I think the leaders need to define where they prefer to go in, in each situation. Of course, that you may you may be trying to do continuous improvement, and maybe you come up with innovation. <laughs> Why not? That's that's also possible. Um, so it's it's really hard to draw a line there, um, in in my perspective. Um, but for example, when I uh, when I did my book. Um, I innovated a bit actually because I, I uh, included how to implement 5S in, you know, in a normal manufacturing company, but I also adapted it on how to use it at home, for example. I think that that could be kind of an innovation because you're trying to do something, a method that you use in a place, you're trying to use it in a totally different place. Hmm? Uh, that's 
that's an innovation. Sometimes innovation is not is nothing crazy, but it's something that you you never seen before. Um, and uh, as as uh, you mentioned before, um, you are connecting things that you thought they were disconnected. Mm -hmm. And so, do you think that um, you know when it comes to continuous improvement in quality, mm -hmm. is it? It, it, do you think there's an advantage for a company to pro focus on that first and then go to innovation, or, or should they, you know, just jump in and go, go, you know, fast forward with both at the same time? What are your thoughts there? Well, I, I think I, you you need both. Um, part of it is it, it has to do with the culture. If you have a culture where you are promoting change. You will have a little bit of, of both. Sometimes you will you will have improvements, little improvements here and there, and you will also have innovation. The problem is with the when you say uh, this is an innovative company, and innovation maybe has to do only with uh, new products and new services. And the way I see it, continuous improvement or innovation can be also in the processes. So you don't need to be uh, uh, you know a tech company to innovate. Uh, everyone, every industry can innovate. You're innovating in, in healthcare. You can innovate um, in a school. You can innovate everywhere. Um, so it's part of if, if you want to allow employees to to make changes, to create a culture of change, you will have both. If you want a culture of status quo, probably you will not have not not improvement, not innovation, yeah, not even innovation. So it's what is the message that you're sending your employees? What is it that you want? Um, you want to be, you want to change? Okay, go ahead and change as much as you can. Little improvements and also big improvements. Well, that's something that, that companies need to think. What What is it that they, they expect from the employees? Wow, yeah. So it's it's a little bit about managing those expectations, in addition mm -hmm. to uh, looking at how you're you know blending continuous improvement with innovation. But they can they can go together. Is what I hear you saying. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I wanted to circle back to Sean and talk about. So you know you talked about blockchain and how long blockchain has has been. You know, as a technology, how long it's been around, but it seems like it's it's been a slow climb, in, you know, up the hill in embracing this technology in different spaces. And so, you know, that that makes me think, you know, why are companies, uh, why is it so hard for companies to embrace that innovation? And and what are some of the things that you see that we can do to change that trend? And, and open our companies up more to accepting technologies like blockchain? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll circle back to something that both Karen and Luciana have both said, that it's cultural. And if you have something that works today, it's hard to change because you don't recognize the need to innovate. When you find that there's an inefficiency or an extra cost, or a competitor that's leaping ahead, or some other change, that's when the recognition starts. And so, although there are different models for how this is accomplished, and we've heard a couple different ones today, uh, I like to think of it as plan, execute, measure, and correct, which is you know plan, plan, do, uh, uh, check, and act. It's it's the same. And planning, uh, this idea that planning is is just a plan, it really is composed of three different components, which is uh, research, uh, collaboration, and then a decision about that plan. So without the research to know, you know what can be done, then it's difficult to come up with a set of alternatives. But if you're never willing to even look at an alternative because you think that what you have today works, uh, then you never even get to that planning stage and you don't, you don't start the process of of improvement. So the first thing is recognizing that any employee uh, or any individual, any entity can make the, 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 the note to say, hey, you know, we could do better. 
And to recognize that and to say that you will welcome that, uh, just the same as Karen was talking earlier about welcoming failure uh, and Luciana was talking about welcoming uh, this idea in a, in a culture uh, where it's accepted that you can fail. And there's some great books on that. Uh, I'll just throw it out there, The Logic of Failure. <laughs> uh, but it's by Dorner. But the, the idea that, that we can accept that culture first uh, is, I think, one of the big problems that we have. So when you when you look in, in a you know microscopic lens and you look at a, a specific technology like blockchain, um, blockchain or distributed ledger technology, and blockchain is a very specific type of distributed ledger technology. Uh, these DLTs, why do we need them? Well, because it's a distributed ledger. Because it can't it can't be duped. Why else? Because everybody's participating. Uh, because there's 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 fewer or zero instances of fraud. Uh, you know, why is it used? It's, so it, it's caught on in the financial world, and then there's a lot of resistance in the financial world because a lot of people already have ledgers. And do we really need a distributed ledger? And one of the things that we look at, certainly in the utility industry and in many other industries too, is, well, if we don't need to change, and the cost of the change outweighs the cost to continue to do work in a specific way, then does it make sense to do that? And so now all of a sudden you're looking at a cost-benefit relationship. And so if you don't get to the planning stage to evaluate the cost-benefit itself, then you, you can't take that next step. So the plan going to the execution, uh, you have to be free to research. And so I wanted to pick up on something that Luciana said, and that is that you should always have an innovation group that's testing the waters of all the things that are accepted. Because it's, if you have a division or, a, you know, you're a manager or a director or, or a, you know, no matter what your management title is, your assumption is that things are working because that's your job to make it work. And so if you say that things can change, if it doesn't come from you, then that's a threat. And I think that that as a component of our corporate culture is one of the reasons that it doesn't, things don't move faster in terms of innovation when they're disruptive. Now, not all innovation is disruptive, and I'll, I'll throw that out there and see where the conversation goes. <laughs> so not all innovation is disruptive. So Karen, when you, when you look at the innovation initiatives that you supported, uh, and, and, I, and I go back to, you know, healthcare systems, and we talk about hospitals, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I want disruptive uh, <laughs> in the middle of my surgery. So. So uh, when, when you're looking at innovation through that lens, uh, you know, the small steps of innovation versus those kind of large incremental uh, radical kind of innovation steps, um, how, 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 do, how do we balance these two and, and where, should, where should our mindset be in terms of how we focus ourselves on, on thinking about innovation from those two perspectives? So again, if I was focused, because you mentioned healthcare, speaking about healthcare, um, healthcare is such a unique situation because there's kids in garages developing stuff that are that can outperform some very expensive medical procedures. So what I've noticed in different aspects of healthcare, um, more so than in government and also in uh, higher ed, where healthcare is expensive and the way we run it in the United States is um, bulky. And so there's a constant uh, population out there, a growing population that are try is trying to get healthcare cheaper, faster, um, less invasive. And so when I say kids in garages, there, there are very intelligent people working all over the place that can reduce time and cost on a lot of healthcare procedures. So the dilemma I see is you have these big hospitals that are big, massive, bulky, lots and lots of uh, administration running them, and the incentive to actually cheaper and faster is not innate to that structure and that system. So when you have um, a perfect example, you know, um, UCF, the University of Central Florida is just right down the road. And they, uh, about three years, four years ago, they, kids, 
in their innovation lab, which I loved going in there and seeing what they were doing, came up with these um, uh, artificial limbs for kids that um, were fast, cheap, made on 3D um, machines, and as opposed to artificial limbs for children of the old school, very expensive, not cool looking, and these you could have Spider-Man hand, all kinds of stuff. And so I've seen over and over again the dilemma of uh, healthcare people facing trying to deliver good health care when they know they're being disrupted at every turn. When the system they've created can't really, it, it is not oriented to innovate and be slick and fast and cheap. Now, I don't know if that really answered the question, but that's a, that to me is a baseline understanding about health care and it's the dilemma we face. And um, I'm so interested to see what's going to happen in the future as years roll by because we need a sleeker, faster, cheaper health care, but we need a good health care. So um, innovation is, um, I'll say another thing, innovation is always, we always, and I'm not the only one that says this, but like next practice. So in healthcare, you're always looking at best practice, the best practice, magnet status, all that. But best practice is gets to be kind of just oh hum or everyone's doing it. And so you're really looking for next practice as things keep changing and we learn more and new innovations come out. And so I have had compassion for big um, bulky healthcare systems that are trying to do their best, but oftentimes are not on the cutting edge because they can't afford it. But now, I know a lot of healthcare systems and they do have uh, skunk works type stuff going on. They have innovation groups. But I think the biggest challenge in healthcare is to take a straight headlong dive into innovation and just let the chips fall where they may. I think that's what we need to do. I mean, it's pretty bold to say it, but so innovation in healthcare happens. It'll happen outside of healthcare all the time, inside of healthcare. Doctors innovate quite a bit, but they're bound by certain IP rules that keep them unmotivated on some levels. Um, some hospitals really honor the doctor's new inventions and give them a lot of IP latitude. Um, it's a, it's, <laughs> We should talk about healthcare more. We should all talk about healthcare more and demand more from uh, disruption, the disruptive minds in healthcare. I think we would get better answers. And I have no idea, Rebecca, if I answered your question. So, sorry. <laughs> I just have a passion about it. We, ha we have to demand more innovation in healthcare. And it's not an easy demand to make. Yeah. My, uh, my oldest son's a physician, and I and I, we always have great conversations about um, what he's in California, and so um, yeah. So so we were talking about innovation because uh, again, innovation involves failure. So I, I'll just pitch this out as a general question. Anybody who wants to pick it up, but when we look at innovation. What are some of the pitfalls of innovation? Because, you know, when we're looking at it, um, and especially in industries like healthcare, like utilities, like fi the financial services industry, these are industries that are typically risk averse. And so what are some of those possible pitfalls uh, of innovation that we just need to be aware of as we're, as we're pursuing innovation? I think a pitfall is that we don't um, set an environment up to innovate on low res levels, easy iterative level, levels, that we can start the innovation ball rolling and we don't have to disrupt everything to begin with. We can get ideas rolling and iterate them, get feedback, tweak them, prototype them. We just need an environment, more environments like that, that allow that, I think. Yeah, and, and I think that um, I know I I come from Argentina, so I I saw the healthcare system in Argentina is totally different. But um, I think that what we're uh, what may we may be failing in the U.S. is just innovating how to cure 
but we're not innovating about the, the healthcare system itself. And how can you, because when I go to a doctor, I, I think about tons of ways I, they could improve the service they provide to me. I mean, not how they cure me or treat my illness or, or whatever. Um, I recently had a baby in the hospital and it was, was great, but the system, many things in the system were could have been improved, making it more affordable, making it easier. Um, the system for, for pain, for uh, for the, the C-section, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, after six months, I still receive bills. That, that, that shouldn't work like that. Uh, in Argentina, I had a baby, the same kind of surgery, everything was the same, and I paid almost nothing just for the haircut for my baby. That was all I paid for. <laughs> and, uh, and no bills, no bills at home. Really, I just pay in my insurance, that was enough. So I think there, sometimes we need to focus not on the product, but on the system or, or whatever is around the product we're building. Yeah, well systems, John talks about systems. Hmm? Yes, I, I do. <laughs> uh, if, we, if we think of, Rebecca, I'm just gonna jump in. The, the idea that there's a system and then there's a product or a service, and then there's the fulfillment of that product and service. To me, uh, and I, I just want to, you know, rewind for a moment and and think a little bit about continuous improvement again. Um, this idea of continuous improvement is improving the processes that are already in place, and process innovation is about solving problems in the most effective way. So if we if we can accept that continuous improvement is always being done, and then that's the job culturally of the management of that system uh, to improve the processes that are already in place, then it's actually a separate entity that's responsible for solving problems in a more effective way. Because if you can simply just improve the processes that are already there, that could be innovative. And I, I like what Luciana said about that earlier. Uh, and this idea that continuous improvement is happening over time. It, it never finished. So in, improvements are incremental. And when we talk about innovation, it could be something that's so big that you have to redesign from the ground up. So when we start talking about healthcare, and I'm not an expert in healthcare, so I, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't go to that, but the idea that what can we do better, uh, you know, I think it's insufficient insight so how do we get to that insight through research? It's insufficient engagement, right. uh, engagement in the organization. And all of our panelists today have talked about that, about the engagement, but it really has to be risk-free. And so if there is an innovation group, you have to welcome and encourage and hope that the innovation group will work with your team because it will help your division improve. And I think that one of the issues that we get to, and one of the things that can can be helped, most importantly in this system, is that we don't recognize innovators uh, as helpers, we recognize them as disruptors. Mm -hmm. And a disruptor is a negative connotation. It disrupts. And you're, you're brought up with a specific set of language skills and disruption is not a kindly uh, taken word, generally speaking. So when you talk about disruption, you think to yourself, well, everything's going to change, and that means I could lose my job. Or it means I'm not doing a good job, and if innovation comes in to help me, then something must change, and so maybe I'm to blame. Instead, you have to flip that on its side and say, no, instead we have to welcome innovators, and they need to be separate than operators, because operations is in a process of continuous improvement all the time. Uh, but innovation needs to be separate, in my opinion. And, and that's one of, the, one of the things that I would at least offer for further discussion. And Sean, I like your idea that innovators coming in to help, and especially if the innovators are looking to learn what's going on. That I think then it's, the collaboration just naturally starts to grow. So if it, when I've seen innovators come in and say we're gonna, this is all wrong, we're going to uh, just redo this to make it better. But I love it when innovators come in and say, help us understand what's happening here. We want to experience what's happening. How can we learn from you? And then uh, 
innovate from there. And it just creates an environment where um, people can be at their best. And um, I think when people are at their best, they think creatively. And we are open to the place of them. Indeed. Wow, this is, this is, it seems like this discussion, this is a very, uh, interesting and fascinating discussion, and we may have to have a part two to this discussion to really dig into uh, some of the areas that were mentioned earlier. But we are we are at our time, and so I want to uh, close out. We started off with what does innovation mean to you. So I want to go around the table and ask the question. What do you think of the future of innovation? You know, how is innovation really um, important to companies and businesses and government uh, as we uh, are go further into the 21st century? So I'll, I'll start with uh, Karen. I think it's the key to the future. I think it's, it's, yeah, the key to the future. It's their lifeline. Luciana. Yeah, I think uh, innovation has to be everyone's uh, job, really. Um, so um, what I think that needs to be in, in innovate, uh, what needs to be innovating companies is how teams are formed, um, how teams are managed, so that um, it can actually be everyone's job and not just the, the job of a group of people or a management uh, team, but everyone in the company, from the janitorial guy to the, the CEO. And Sean. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and it's been, it has been a real pleasure to be here. Uh, to me, uh, innovation is native to the human species. And our civilization has grown uh, by droves. Uh, and certainly with the world population approaching uh, 10 billion in the next, you know, 30 to 40 years, 30 years, uh, you know, that's 20, 20% 20 more people. So how can we, how can we innovate our way uh, past the tipping point to support our continual growth of our population? And I, I think it's native to our species. We'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I like, you know, certainly what we've heard today uh, and, you know, when we think about creativity, uh, human beings are really exceptional at creativity. And to me, the future is about the collaboration uh, between ourselves and machines. Machines, because as we continue down the path of artificial intelligence to machine learning, we understand that if we are the most creative, uh, then machines will help us. And it's a partnership between ourselves and these intelligences that we're building to solve specific problems. And so I, I think our future lies in a, a closer relationship with machines. Hmm. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. And with that, I want to thank our panelists for an engaging and informative discussion. And I'll turn it over to Rhonda to close us out. Rhonda? I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and our wonderful facilitator for an interesting, exciting, explorative discussion on all the realms and industries that innovation lives within and that each and every one of you are sparking a country and potentially the world. So thank you for bringing this phenomenal <laughs> to us. Don, if I could ask you to go to the last slide. There we go. So I want to invite each and every one of our members, honor you for being here tonight, and invite you to our 15 October 2021 Innovation to give a phenomenal lineup of partners and thought leaders and authors who are moving innovation forward in so many spaces around the globe. So it's going to be a treat for you to enjoy their wisdom, get sparked through their frameworks, and we hope that you'll be able to join us. We would love to have you see if you have interest. Our communication channels are on the slide. You can reach out to us anytime to engage, collaborate, help you build your innovation program going forward. Again, thanks to our phenomenal 
panelist, to our wonderful facilitator, and to Don, our webinar chair, for making this go. So I'll turn over back to Don. Thank you very much, Randa. Well, we are going to conclude our session. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining this webinar. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.